the story of William Wrigley, Jr. In 1861, shortly after the beginning of the Civil War, William Wrigley, Jr. was born in the city of Philadelphia. School and studies were all right for some people, but not for young Wrigley. He longed for a business career. He sold newspapers, worked in his father's small soap factory, but all this was uninteresting. At the age of 13, he hitched up the family horse and carriage and took to the road, peddling soap up and down the Atlantic coast. Then he headed west, arriving in Kansas City penniless. We find him working behind the counter of a dingy donut and coffee shop. Well, what do you have tonight? Hello, Wrigley. Donut and cup of coffee. Oh, all right. Well, I haven't seen you in here for some time. No. Uh-huh. You seem to be worried about something. What makes you think so? Well, I can tell by the way you're eating that donut. Hmm. You see that man at the end of the counter? Yeah. You notice how he eats? He swallows his food whole. He's paying more attention to the newspaper than to what he's eating. I can tell he hasn't a worry in the world. What's that got to do with me? Well, you see, you're chewing harder, and you're sitting here sort of looking into space. I've noticed that people always chew the hardest when they're sad. <laughs> That's foolishness. <laughs> oh, maybe. Well, I lost my job the other day. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. I got a wife and kid. Say, I'm leaving here tomorrow. My father wants me to help him with his soap business back in Philadelphia. Of course, this isn't much of a job, but it pays 15 a week. You think I could get it? Well, I'll talk to the boss tonight. Well, thanks a lot. You know, you're a right smart youngster. Oh, not especially. I just keep my eyes open. You know, you can learn a lot in a place like this if you're observant. Watch people. Study them. Notice how they look. And, and how they chew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a shame to waste such talent selling coffee and donuts. Oh, I guess it doesn't make much difference what your product is, as long as you can sell a lot of it. Of course, I'm, I'm no whirlwind in the donut business, and for that matter, I doubt if I'll ever be a millionaire peddling soap. It was with misgivings that young Wrigley went back to the career of soap salesman. At the age of 24, he was married to Ada Foote, and in 1891, he settled in Chicago acting as Western distributor for his father's factory. Several months later, in the dark warehouse behind his office, Wrigley is industriously ripping the lid from the newly arrived packing case. Bill, what are you doing? Oh, hello, Ada. Come here, see what I have. Well, what are they? Premiums. With each box of soap, I'm going to give away premiums. A coffee pot, a box of pocket knives, fishing tackle, and some of this here. But you're selling soap, not pocket knives and fishing tackle. Well, that's true. But the customers don't seem to want our soap. It's a necessity, true. Everybody should use soap, but for some strange reason, we can't sell it. Now your father be furious if he hears about Why? it. Why? Think of the appeal it'll have. Free. With every five boxes of soap, we're giving away a lovely meat grinder. William Wrigley, sometimes <laughs> I believe you're not quite balanced. Now, what have you got there? Oh, this, my dear, is chewing gum. We'll give this away, too. I bought it from the Zeno Company at half price. You think people will buy soap just to get something to chew? Well, it's possible. At any rate, it won't do any harm to try. <laughs> well, give me a stick of that gum. I'd like to taste it. Well, go ahead. It's wintergreen flavor. Mm. <laughs> How do you like it? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think it tastes an awful lot like, like the soap. <laughs> Ada, big news. I was right about those premiums. They're going like wildfire, especially the chewing gum. I've received about a thousand orders for more chewing gum. But how about the soap? <laughs> we're through selling soap. From now on, we're going to concentrate on chewing gum. I intend to make it myself. And believe me, the gum I make won't taste like soap. Well, you don't know anything about making chewing gum. No. <laughs> I've investigated the Zeno Company, and I've found out how they manufacture the stuff. They use spruce and paraffin all mixed up like dough, and then they roll it and cut it into sticks. Well, you think you can make it? Yes, but I intend to make chicle the main ingredient. Well, what's chicle? It's a gum obtained from a South American tree. Well, supposing this gum wouldn't sell. Oh, it's bound to sell. We'll offer more premiums, more fish and tackle and coffee pots. <laughs> That's the way to make things sell. Let the world know you're alive. Advertise. <laughs> The 
product first known as Wrigley's Vassar sent the sales of chewing gum skyrocketing. Along with the increasing production, William Wrigley's fortune mounted higher and higher until, in 1911... Well, gentlemen, the deal is closed. The Zeno Gum Company is now my property. It's a fair price, Mr. Wrigley. $250,000. And it makes you the world's leading manufacturer of chewing gum. Yes. Yes, I suppose I'm at the top now. Well, it's a good position to be in, and a hard one to keep. You will stay there, Mr. Wrigley. Well, good day. Good day. And uh, good luck to you, sir. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, that deal's over, Stuart. Yes, sir. My congratulations, sir. I believe it was a very wise move. So do I. Although I could have bought the company 15 years ago for a hundredth of that price. Yes, but you thought it would be better to spend the money on advertising. Say, I've got an idea. Hand me that telephone book, yeah. please. How many people do you think are listed in this book? No, oh, thousands. Oh, and addresses for every one of them. I'm going to send a package of our chewing gum to every person in this directory. Oh, but, sir, do you realize how much that would cost? Certainly, but it's good advertising. But in view of the fact that you've just paid out $250,000... Look, I made this business what it is because of one thing, advertising. I know, sir. Advertising but... is like running a train. You've got to keep on shoveling coal into the engine. Once you stop stoking, the fire goes out and the train slows down. The Wrigley Company is under full steam now, and, man, we're going to keep stoking. Throughout the years, William Wrigley kept stoking, building the Wrigley Company to a giant concern. In 1919, for the sum of $3 million, he purchased Santa Catalina Island, a ridge of olive green mountains 26 miles off the coast of Southern California. Under Wrigley's supervision, Catalina Island became one of the West's most famed playgrounds, a glittering diadem in the Pacific, where the friendly atmosphere of Spanish California still prevails. Soon, large white-hulled steamers loaded with pleasure seekers plied the Blue Channel from Los Angeles Harbor to Avalon. Hey, Jim, come over here. Look at the flying fish. Yeah, their fins are sure pretty when the sunlight catches them. Where's Murray? In there, dancing. I like it better out here on deck. Come on up forward. You can see Avalon. You know, those seagulls have been following us all the way from Wilmington. Wow, did you see the pelican grab that fish? Snatched it right out of the water. Oh, birds always follow the boats. They know the passengers will feed them. And they're scattering now. Say, here comes a plane. Big one, too. It's the uh, regular passenger plane to Avalon. Folks can't wait to get there, so they go by seaplane. Oh, that's Avalon right over there. Around White Building is the dance casino. Did Wrigley build all this? Yeah, every bit of it. Avalon used to be a port for Spanish galleons. They came here to escape pirates. The Indians called it the Bay of the Moons. Uh, what's over on that far ridge? It looks like a goat. <laughs> Catalina's famous for its wild goats. The Spaniards left him here about 300 years ago. There's a herd of buffalo on the other side, but a movie company left them. <laughs> well, we'll be ready to land pretty soon. Come on, I want to get on that side. Maybe I can see Bill Wrigley. They say he likes to meet the boats. You can get through easier this way. Uh, but first, you've got to find Mary. <laughs> See that man over there standing on the dock? That's Wrigley. You mean the heavy set brown faced man in the white hat? That's him. With the cigar. He doesn't look like a millionaire. Well, what's the crowd gathered on the pier for? Well, the whole island turns out on the woodlands. Up there, Joe! Look on the plank! Well, here we go. Well, say, there's Mary on the upper deck. She's waving to us. I see her. Come here, Mary! They've lowered the gangplank. Catalina Island, with its swaying palms, glass-bottomed boats and tropical sunshine, a resort made possible by William Wrigley's millions. And along with the development of Catalina, the Wrigley Company's profits mounted higher. 
Then, in October of 1929, the ticker tapes began to unravel an ominous message. Stocks were declining. America was facing the worst business disaster in its history. Factories closed. Men were thrown out of work, forced to roam the streets, hungry and homeless. Mr. Wrigley, I'm from the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have an interview. Oh, yes, certainly. Take a chair. Thank you. Is it true that you're going to give $100,000 to the relief drive? Well, as soon as I made out the check a few hours ago. (laughs) $100,000 is a lot of money. I guess I can afford it. I'm turning that big building on the west side over to the Salvation Army as sleeping quarters, you know. Uh, There are many men nowadays with cash to give away. Uh, Would you mind telling me how you managed to make that much money? Your secret of success? (laughs) Well... Yeah, it's no secret. You see, what I've accomplished has been done because of the work me happy, and I've enjoyed every moment of the battle. Yeah, I have made a lot of money, but, young man, I've only got three suits of clothes, a place to sleep, meals a day, and a bathtub. <laughs> well, of course, maybe it's a little bit better bathtub. <laughs> but this depression, has it affected the chewing gum business much? Oh, not much. You see, everybody feels pretty sad right now. And I found out through past experience that people always chew harder when they're sad. During the years of business depression, Wrigley devoted time, money, and the use of his vast properties to care for the destitute and homeless. In January 1932... The world was saddened by the passing of William Wrigley, Jr. at the age of 70. A man of the people, philanthropist, sportsman, an all-around good fellow. Captain of Industry. <laughs> <laughs> 